I'm a grown ass man with no idea what it's like to fall in love. Political wonder Pete Buttigieg. Mayor Pete. Do something different, do something better. On Making History. Talk about being the first serious gay candidate for the presidency. Owning his identity. What made you finally come out? Straight people don't have to come out. And what comes next? Racism is not gonna help us get out of this country. What scares you? Do you plan on being a dad? If Joe Biden were to win, what role would you love to have in his administration? Oh, wow. You can't live in this world today and not be curious. In fact, if ever there was a time to hear from more than the usual suspects, it's now. This is The Carlos Watson Show. Maybe we'll surprise you. Maybe you'll be mad at us sometimes or inspired. Not only do I hope people will see more with the show, but I hope they'll do more and be more. People, the good stuff starts now. Mayor, I'm going to jump into it by welcoming you to the show. Uh, thank you so much for joining. Thanks for having me. Good to be with you. Um, Mayor, let me start with the name, Mayor Pete. Uh, I can assume how that happened, but why don't you tell me? Who was the first one to call you Mayor Pete, and how did it stick? My predecessor had a comparatively easier to pronounce name, but uh, they knew him as Mayor Steve, so I guess it was just kind of the local tradition. Uh, seems like it's uh, uh, sticking with me past my mayor days, which is uh, fine by me. So knowing that you've loved politics most of your life, uh, what was the most interesting thing that you learned actually running for president? What would you go back and tell younger Pete? Like, here are the two things that are going to surprise you most about actually running for president. I mean, it's it's almost a, an out-of-body experience. It's, it's hard to describe it. When you're in it, you're just going. You don't even have time to reflect. I think that the really striking thing is the constant motion. So you're in the whole country at once. You know, we have some days where we were maybe in four states in the same day. And at the same time, you could kind of see, I guess because you were moving around so much, you could see what didn't change. And you would begin to notice that there was sometimes a little daylight between the things that uh, commentators would ask you about the most and the things that voters would ask you about the most. The press was usually more interested in uh, drama among Democrats, the kind of uh, blow by blow, the, the horse race. Um, if there was one issue that I heard way more about from voters than it was from reporters, it was mental health. And, uh, you know, the other thing you really feel is how personal politics is, whether it's your health care or, or your marriage. People are pretty smart about how the decisions that are being uh, debated and batted around as talking points wind up hitting home, literally. And when co somebody comes up to tell you something, and you're running for president, whatever it is they're going to tell you is probably the most important thing going on in their life that they think uh, leadership or the government could do something about. And you, you feel that every day. You did something else that I haven't heard anyone give you public credit for, but you were the first person in public life that I heard use the phrase systemic racism. One of the things I'm proudest of that the campaign developed was called the Frederick Douglass Plan, and it was a plan to tackle systemic racism. First of all, uh, I should say, it's, it's not like I sat in a room and thought this up. Uh, it was uh, a plan that was shaped by mainly black voices uh, on the campaign and, and outside of the campaign, but who we turned to for advice. Because of course I knew I had a certain perspective and I also lacked uh, a certain p perspective and lived experience. And I'd also seen all the ways that you know, just trying to rub out a, a racist policy and replace it with a neutral one wasn't going to be enough. There needs to be a way for all of us as a country, but especially among white people, which is where most of the change has to happen, to grapple with the fact that there's more to the racism that we're all mixed up in than just a, 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 a character flaw in individuals. And there's also more to fixing it than just defeating the likes of the KKK. Um, and so that, that systemic quality to it is so interwoven in the way America works. Mayor Pete, take me back to your actual run. Um, what did you get right? Like, what are people going to say one day at the Kennedy School of Government um, when they do the case study on the campaign? Well, when you first get it into your head to run for president, the, you want to 
find out whether this is just something that makes sense to you or whether uh, other people uh, agree in a critical mass of other people who would vote for you and, 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 and send money to your campaign and, and, and support you and put their, put their reputations on the line. You know, when somebody says, especially if you're a long shot candidate, uh, which is certainly how we were perceived at the beginning. If somebody says they're supporting you, even if it's on social media, they're giving something of themselves to you. They're taking a risk on your behalf, even if it's just socially. And so, uh, you know, the early days of the campaign were really the days of finding out if we were alone. And, you know, over time, we began to realize that this really was something. Uh, there was a moment in New Hampshire where we were arriving for what we thought was going to be a meet and greet. And I got there and uh, there were hundreds of people. It turned into a rally and I, I could see something was up. Of course, afterwards, you think of a million things you'd wish you'd known on day one or done differently. We had a brilliant team uh, that figured out often with, you know, kind of duct tape and chicken wire in the early days how to get things up and running. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we really needed in particular to work to introduce me to constituencies that were skeptical of newcomers and where if I had it to do over again, I would have had more voices from right here in South Bend, black voices in particular, uh, on, on the trail with me. Because if I had gotten the same support in uh, South Carolina from black voters that I did from black voters in South Bend, uh, who knows, we might have won. But, uh, uh, you know, even now, uh, having stepped off the campaign trail for nearly, uh, well, about a half a year, uh, I'm still processing it and putting it all together and thinking about what I've learned. Yeah, I mean, because you guys had such an interesting primary when I think about it. And, you know, a couple things stood out for me. That CNN town hall was the moment when I think you took the long shot up and comer mantle away from Beto. I know that it's more uh, traditional to maybe come from Congress to have a background in Washington. But I would also argue that we would be well served if Washington started to look more like our best run cities and towns rather than the other way around. And I felt like that was the first light switch moment. And then the other piece that I thought about as I saw your campaign uh, rise and go is I wondered a little bit about Iowa, whether with all of the drama around the caucuses itself and the reporting and what have you, if you should have been more aggressive in declaring yourself the unequivocal winner. I wonder, I mean, when you make a choice, you always get it from all sides, right? So we got blown up by a lot of people who said that, you know, I, I couldn't even say that we were victorious. Uh, look, the truth was we, we knew certain things that night. We knew that, that our performance was an incredible victory and we knew that we seemed to be ahead. But, you know, you really need somebody else to, to call it and certify it. We needed the Iowa Democratic Party to say, okay, these are the numbers, these are the counts, uh, and Pete's the winner. And it just didn't come, at least it didn't come that night. But you also, you know, the, the, the first really uh, memorable political advice I got from, from a, a political figure I looked up to was uh, Joe Kernan. He recently passed away, but he was the mayor here in South Bend, and then he was governor. And when I was just working up the courage to run for mayor as a 29-year-old, I, I got him to, uh, uh, he agreed to have lunch with me. And when I finally you know, I asked, what do you think? Uh, I'm thinking I might run for mayor. He stared at this basket of French fries for a good minute. And then he just looked up to me and he said, you know, so much in politics is outside of your control. And you just don't know. So no matter how much you prepare, no matter how much work you do, no matter how brilliant your team is, there's some moments that come along that uh, just have whatever effect they're gonna have. And one thing that, you know, I was ready to win Iowa. I was ready to lose Iowa. I was not ready to win Iowa and be unable to have it confirmed for a matter of weeks. Mayor Pete, talk about being the first serious gay candidate for the presidency. How did it play out for you personally on the campaign trail? Obviously, we, we knew it would be uh, on a lot of people's minds. And we knew it pre would present some, some unique challenges and saw that, you know, from some of my first campaign appearances where, uh, you know, uh, there were anti-LGBT uh, demonstrators intervening in events. And it's it's one thing if, if, if there are demonstrators because they disagree with you on a policy. It's another because they just disagree with you know, they don't, they can't accept what you are. Uh, and at the same time, you know, what I found was that this fact about our campaign was actually part of what it made it empowering for a lot of people. And I think by being able to talk about the, the search and the struggle for belonging and, and the particular version of it that I lived, it actually helped us reach a lot of other people who had something else on their mind. 
I, I think it, it helped us connect, you know, not to compare struggles, they're all different, but, uh, but to connect with a lot of different people who were, who were uh, in that, that struggle for belonging in some way, shape, or form. The most touching things were the encounters I would have, sometimes with kids, teenagers, who would, you know, uh, barely be able to speak when, when they met me or sometimes would confide in me something they hadn't told others and feeling that responsibility when, when, a, when a kid was so much on the line quietly comes out to you while shaking your hand on a road passes you a note and you're just thinking about what that kid might be up against. What was it like for you as a kid who hadn't come out yet? Was it an active wrestling? Was it, was there a struggle? Was it what, what was it like for you? I think it could best be described as a very low level deep civil war inside and you know I knew that I was different but I wasn't prepared to come out even to myself when I was a teenager uh, it felt like if I did if I even began to ask myself those questions I would be taking everything else that that uh, that, that I cared about in, in life on the outside and and setting it on fire so I just didn't go there uh, you know it's different for everybody and you're ready when you're ready uh, but I hope that uh, each passing year, it also becomes less and less of a thing. You know, straight people don't have to come out. <laughs> well, what made you finally come out? You know, the thing that put me over the edge was the deployment. You know, the, the truth was, uh, I didn't really feel how much I was missing in life, not having a romantic life. I was so busy being mayor that it just filled my days. And then I had this experience as a mayor, I was, I was uh, uh, deployed uh, because I was also a reservist. And... I sat down, as you do when you, when you go to a, a war zone, and, and I had to write a letter to, uh, uh, you know, it just literally says, just in case, it's still in my desk drawer, that letter that tells your loved ones what, what you uh, want them to know. Uh, and actually, I didn't write about being gay there either, but uh, I wrote about how full of a life I'd had. And yet I realized, uh, certainly by the time I left and, and absolutely by the time I came back, that. You know, I'm in my 30s. I'm in a position of responsibility. I'm the mayor of a city. I've been to war and back. I'm a, I'm a grown ass man with no idea what it's like to fall in love. And the idea that I could have lost my life halfway around the world uh, and gone to my grave not knowing what it was like to be in love, I just realized that was not, that was no way to live. How did you, what made you fall for Chasson? Well, it started with a smile. As soon as I saw his picture, uh, I, uh, I knew I wanted to meet him. And then I did, and there was just this kind of wit about him. Uh, and uh, he's somebody who knows exactly who he is. And he's somebody who just has this, this unbelievable heart. And I really won the lottery uh, because I was, I was pretty new to dating, uh, to dating men anyway. And uh, really lucked out in that pretty soon into my process of coming out, I met him and just, uh, you know, it just felt, I just liked who I was when I was around him and I, I liked who he was. You know, he didn't ask for politics. He didn't come, he, he, he's a teacher, um, uh, first in, in his family to complete college. Uh, and as he puts it, always saw politics as something that kind of happened to him and his family, not something he could be part of. But uh, sure enough, reluctantly, as he entered that, that, that world with me, because it was, I was a package deal, it turned out that, that he's, just a, he's just really good at it. And in particular, he's, he's really attuned to the fact that uh, as a candidate, and certainly when you're in office as a, as a mayor, part of what you can do is just, just make people feel better. Uh, make people feel accepted, uh, let people know you see them. What's the most interesting thing you've learned about change? I mean, so often people feel, similar to what Chaston said, that change happens to people as opposed to getting to be a change agent. What's the most interesting thing you've learned about being a change agent? The, the biggest thing I've learned is that uh, you never know where you're gonna, uh, where a word you say or a thing you do or connection you form is gonna matter. And so you have to be alive to everything that's happening around you. Sometimes it's the slightest word that got me in the most trouble or uh, wound up uh, being one of the most uh, positive things in the campaign. Talk to me, uh, Mayor Pete, if you don't mind, a little bit about the decision to endorse Vice President Biden, because I thought that, that your former boyhood hero, Bernie Sanders, was 48 hours away from becoming the nominee, which would have been as wildly improbable as anything we've seen in politics, except in the last 10 years. How did that come about? I thought back to what motivated me to run in the first place, and that was a desire to uh, unify, to, to bring the party together, 
and to defeat Donald Trump. We made it clear that the whole idea was about rallying the country together to defeat Donald Trump and to win the era for the values that we share. And that was always a goal that was much bigger than me becoming president. And it is in the name of that very same goal that I'm delighted to endorse and support Joe Biden for president. And those same things have motivated me to get in the race. There was a certain point where uh, in the service of those higher goals, I had to get out of the race. And then I realized I had to not just get out of the race, but I had to step forward quickly at, at that moment when so much was in the air. And even though, uh, you know, Vice President Biden and I uh, are obviously very different messengers, but one of the things that really struck me from day one of his campaign was his vocabulary about the soul of the nation. We're in a battle for the soul of the nation. His understanding that uh, this is a moral as well as a policy office. Everything this nation stands for is at stake. And, and did you coordinate with the other candidates? Because I, I felt like if it had just been one person, I don't know if it would have been as impactful. Well, there was no room or, or, or even, uh, you know, a uh, round of phone calls to coordinate it all. But what I do think was probably going on is a lot of us going through the same process at the same time. And it's a tough place to be. You know, it's if you put everything you've got into running and then suddenly you realize it's not going to happen. And, uh, you know, the, the hours that are playing out in front of you might be the hours where you could make the biggest difference. And you think, well, you know, how do I u use that for the most good? We felt it was time for the party to come together behind Joe Biden and put all our energy into getting him into the White House and defeating Donald Trump. If Joe Biden were to win, what role would you love to have in his administration? Well, I, I'd love a, a chance to return to public service, and I'm definitely going to be uh, doing everything I can to support the uh, Biden-Harris administration, whether that's uh, from a role in government or, or from the outside. But uh, I'm not letting myself get too uh, far ahead of where we are because uh, we've uh, uh, just got a matter of weeks to make sure that there is a Biden presidency. And, uh, you know, right now by the polls, we're winning and we're winning big, but uh, that should not be a reason to get comfortable or get complacent. We're going to have to work. We're going to have to push. We're going to have to sprint through the tape. Mayor Pete, tell me a little bit about your book. What moved you to write the book and, and what are kind of some of the key takeaways uh, in, in the book Trust? I thought it was important for this book to come out before the election because I want to start some conversations about what's at stake in the fact that political and social trust in our country have been falling for about 50 years. In other words, uh, people's trust that the government will do the right thing all or most of the time, and even our trust in each other. And this has profound and dangerous consequences. One of them, of course, is if you live in a democracy, democracies rest on a foundation of trust, the trust that your vote will be counted, uh, the, the trust that you put in one another. But also there are more immediate and sometimes lethal dimensions to what happens when there's a lack of trust. And a simple example of that is we're seeing some research right now that says that uh, actually it's a minority of Americans who are sure they would get a vaccine for COVID. Think about what that means. In this era of conspiracy theories, a shockingly large percentage of the American people uh, said that they think that the vaccine uh, had microchips connected to Bill Gates. But also, of course, if we're thinking about trust in medicine, there are some very real reasons why, for example, black Americans are skeptical uh, in a system that has not treated them equally, where they are more vulnerable. And so all of these issues of trust and credibility in institutions and experts in science, even trust that we're living in a shared reality, these are actually life and death questions. And uh, I wanted to start a conversation about that with, uh, uh, with the, the short book that I'll have coming out in October. Um, uh, Mayor Pete, I'm going to switch to rapid fire for a quick moment, if you don't mind. The most interesting celebrity who you met or got to know while running for president. I remember meeting uh, President Carter, uh, getting to know John Lewis. Uh, uh, outside of the political sphere, um, uh, meeting Robert De Niro was pretty, uh, pretty amazing. Our country's produced so many profoundly interesting people, and one of the joys of running for president, you get to meet so many of them, but the thing is you don't get to talk to them for long. Are you now, or have you ever been a spy? Well, I was a, a Navy intelligence officer, but uh, uh, I was pretty transparent about that, so I don't think that counts as a spy. Do you plan on being a dad? Yeah, we do. We're, uh, uh, we're taking steps in that direction, and uh, I'm excited. Uh, a little scared <laughs> by that, too. It's a, 
enormous responsibility, but uh, excited about the possibility and, and excited to see Chastin be a father too. And, and what kind of dad would Mayor Pete be? Are you a dad on TikTok? What kind of dad should we expect you to be? I'd like to think I'd be the cool dad. I'm sure the reverse is true, but uh, I think I'll just focus on hopefully being a good one. Please promise me that you'll come back, that this won't be the uh, the only visit to the show. I'd love to. It's a real pleasure, and uh, thank you for making the time today. I'm grateful. Same here. Great to be with you. Mayor Pete was one of these folks that when I told people who was coming on the show, they were looking forward to. In a brilliant way, he's gone away long enough that people missed him, they kind of want to hear. And so I hope you really enjoyed the conversation. You know, he reminded you why he was so thoughtful and even at 38, people took him seriously as a candidate. I loved his love story with his husband. It'd be interesting to see what comes next for Mayor Pete. A stunning suggestion among my friends here, maybe he becomes chief of staff. Now I was thinking a cabinet spot, but boy, that could be interesting too. Keep your eye on it, and more importantly, subscribe to The Carlos Watson Show and tell a friend. I'll see you soon. Hey, tune into The Carlos Watson Show. It's like no other. You're going to enjoy it every weekday on YouTube.